Hello everyone, I'm Harvey Brownstone and today I'm delighted to welcome an actor, director and singer who won our hearts with his portrayal of the lovable Ralph Mouth on the long running mega hit television series Happy Days. Since then he's appeared in movies like Ed TV, The Great Buck Howard and Man's Best Friend, which recently premiered on Amazon Prime. He's guest starred on many TV shows including Glee, Star Trek, Voyager and Diagnosis Murder. He's directed three feature films, and most recently, he's returned to his first love, music, with his album, D Most, Mostly Swinging, and his Christmas album, Swinging Down the Chimney Tonight. His latest single, Smoke from a Distant Fire, is being released on June 25th. He is, of course, the wonderful Donnie Most. Donnie, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thanks, Harvey. Great to be with you. Thank you. Donnie, before we begin, I have to ask you, do people still come up to you in the street and call you Ralph? Occasionally, not as much as it used to be, you know, back in the day. I'm, I'm, I'm not getting recognized as much, I have to say, but, you know, I am getting a bit older, so a little more separation from the show, I guess. I think you still have that face. Yeah, in certain situations, people will recognize me. It's you know, many actors who appeared in iconic television shows have had problems reinventing themselves because they're so closely associated with the character they played. But Donnie, as hard as it was, you successfully overcame that. Look at the wide variety of roles you've played since Happy Days. In Duality, you played a man who's traveling between different universes against his will. In Mas Man's Best Friend, you play a defense attorney. And in Lost Heart, you play a forward-thinking, conspiracy-loving pastor. How did you develop such versatility as an actor? What I loved about acting from the very beginning was the, the opportunity to play many different kinds of roles. That's what attracted that to me in the first place. So I was very aware, you know, and, and when I started studying acting in New York, I grew up in Brooklyn and I went to a, a, a really good workshop for acting um, starting when I was about 16. And we did scenes from all different, a lot of different plays and a wide variety of genres and, and roles. And, and I, that's what I love. And when I first came out to LA, the early roles that I got were more dramatic. I was, I was much more interested actually in, in doing drama than comedy. So I, I landed a couple of roles. One was on a show called Emergency where I played a guy that became uh, paralyzed in a car accident. And then um, I did a police story where I played this mad sort of psychopathic, a mad bomber. Then when I got Happy Days and, you know, obviously it was a, a comedy and it became so successful, it, it became difficult at, for a while for me to even be considered for, for, for the dramatic roles. I couldn't even get an audition for them, you know, because I was so associated with it as you alluded to and and it was a it was very difficult and um i actually left happy days after my contract was up after the seventh season and one of the reasons was i felt like i had been playing that same character for seven years and, and i knew i was starting to get i was already getting typecast and all that and and that's not who i was I wasn't really like that character. And as an actor, I, I, I mentioned I wanted to play many roles. So I felt that was one of the reasons that I decided not to go back. And, and it was tough because um, I went, you know, like months. I told my agent, I, I'd, I'd like to try to just do some film and theater when I left the show. I, did, I wanted to not do television for a while, um, unless it was maybe a movie for television or a miniseries. But I went six months, I couldn't even get an audition for for a film or anything like that you know it definitely was a challenge uh, but you know i just kept uh, plugging away and i'd start doing theater and um and then eventually i you know when it's too hard to to get in to do films at that time because it's not like it is today today there's a real bridge between the mediums between television and film uh, people go back and forth but back then it was like they were very separate so um it was hard but then um, I told my agent, you know, okay, let's start doing some television. And, and I started getting some roles and you just kept, just kept trying to, you know, break the door down little by little. And, uh, you know, it helped. It helped open up a little something here, a little something there. Not that big breakthrough that I was hoping for, you know, like in one fell swoop where you get this big movie and it changes everything. That didn't happen. 
It was happening more in increments. And in the last five, 10 years, it's really started to open up. And with some of the films that you mentioned, uh, Lost Heart, uh, which I actually just won a, an award at this film festival in Orlando at the International Christian Film Festival. I won Best Supporting Actor in a Feature Film for Lost Heart. That, that felt really nice. And, and, um, and I just got an offer. I'm doing another film starting in two weeks, shooting in Charlotte. So things are really opening up. And I think getting older has helped <laughs> because certainly not at, uh, playing a teenager anymore. I think it has too. And I think your work really speaks for itself. And congratulations on the award. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I was, I was very grateful because, um, you know, it's the kind of thing with, with what I've been trying to do. You know, you need that kind of validation. It's good. Not necessarily just for me. Yes, for me, it's always, it's good. But, you know, perception for other people. And it's like, oh, it gives you a certain kind of credibility that, you know, when you're trying to get away from comedic persona and then you get a, you know, a best actor award in something that they, they, people have a little different perspective in a good way. Oh, for sure. I understand that as a kid, you were deeply affected by watching the Al Jolson movie, The Jolson Story. And that's what got you thinking about being a performer? Yes, absolutely. Um, I was nine years old and you know, in, in New York back then, they had something on TV on Channel 9, I remember, it was called Million Dollar Movie. And that particular week was the Jolson story. The movie just had this major impact on me. Jol Jolson's talent, the, his, his singing, the music itself, the story, you know, really resonated for me on some level. I wound up watching the movie like probably 14 times that week. You know, I mean, just watched it over and over and over. And then I wound up getting album, Jolson albums and I would be singing along to the, to his albums. And, and then I started listening to um, a radio station in New York that played a lot of the great standards, all the great, you know, the American songbook. And, and I got a real education in, in, in that type of music. And I just loved it. I think it's really great that your parents were supportive of your dreams and they found a special school for you in Manhattan where you could learn singing and dancing. But your dad really talked you into pursuing acting more than singing, right? Yeah, you know, it was it was interesting. After I was at the I was at the school, as you mentioned, and and I got handpicked to be part of a, a professional uh, like nightclub review that was comprised of some of the students with ages fourteen to sixteen. There were seven of us, and I performed the summer I was turning fifteen up in the Catskill Mountains, uh, the, the resort area. I was in heaven, I'm going here, you know, I was 15 years old and feeling like, wow, I've made it. I'm singing in this nightclub act, you know? But my dad, he, he was really smart and he wasn't pushing me because I was the one who really wanted to do it. And they, as you mentioned, they were very supportive. They saw how much I wanted to do it. And for some reason, he, he realized that what I was doing in that particular act and all that, I, I think he said, why don't you balance things? And, and he'd seen me act in some plays at school or camp or something. And he said, maybe you should take a real acting class, like a real good, you know, serious one. He had some really good intu intuition about that, <laughs> obviously. And so I did and um, put the music aside, you know, and, and got into this class and, and I really loved it. And that's when things started. And I met a woman who became my manager through that school through the workshop and then started getting me out to on auditions and meeting agents in New York. And, and I started doing a lot of commercials initially, a little TV, but that's when things started really happening for me on the acting side. Now, when you auditioned for Happy Days, am I right that you initially were going for the role of Potsy and that when they offered to create the role of Ralph, just for you, you initially turned it down? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's exactly right. That's what happened. Um, yeah, I, w I went in and met the producers, um, the exec producers, and then they called me back and I had to read that time for Gary Marshall and, and a whole bunch of other people in the room. And I was reading for Potsy. And then they called me back to do a screen test. I went through that whole, it was a bit, it was a long day. It was a kind of a grueling day. I didn't think I did real well. And I was thinking, oh man, I, I don't, there's no way I'm getting that part. And then my agent called 
and said, you didn't get the role of Potsy, but they liked your screen test so much, they want to create a role for you. And there's a small part in the pilot of a guy named Ralph, and they'll they'll make that a regular role. You know, he'll they'll, they'll guarantee you so many episodes, at, you know, seven out of 13 and da, da, da. And at the time, I was up for another a TV movie that was a dramatic piece, and, and I really liked it a lot. And I was more interested, as I mentioned earlier, in drama. It was a movie that was written by the guy who wrote The Summer of 42. So the same writer wrote this movie, and it was going to be directed by Buzz Kulik, who directed the original Brian song, which was like one of the biggest TV movies of all time. And I'm going, that's what I, I want to be doing that kind of production. And I had a very good chance. My audition went great. My agent said, you have a really good chance of getting this. But they weren't going to know for about, you know, about a week. When, when they offered me the, uh, the role of, of this new role for Happy Days, uh, my agent and I said, I, I said, I really prefer to do the, the dramatic film. And he agreed. He said, yeah, let's, I think you, you have a good chance. Let's go for it. And so we passed on happy days. We, we turned it down. But as fate, destiny would have it, my agent happened to play basketball every Saturday at Gary Marshall's house. So during a break in the game, Gary took my agent aside and said, you know, hey, what's with your boy turning us down? And, you know, and he, he told my agent, I think this show, Happy Days, is going to go as a mid-season replacement. It's got a really good chance and we'll give him, guarantee him 10 out of 13 episodes and more money, offered them more money. <laughs> so my agent called me on Monday and said, eh, we might want to reconsider this. And we decided to take, you know, Happy Days because we didn't know if the other one was a definite. And so that's, it's pretty crazy when I think back on how that, on the circumstances that led to this. It is. It's what you call destiny, you know? Yes. Now, you've been quoted as saying that the success of Happy Days was a fortuitous blending of personalities that translated well to the screen. Obviously, Gary Marshall was brilliant at putting the show together, but why do you think we just don't see sitcoms of that caliber anymore on television? I don't know, and I don't know that I'm the right person to ask because I haven't been watching much of, you know, of what's on television in terms of series TV. But I have heard other people make similar observations. Every once in a while, I do see some of the new shows, and I think there's some really good writing. I was watching um, The Kaminsky Method last night of the new season, and there's some really good writing, and the acting is great. So I, I think there are some still some really good comedies. Well, I agree with you about The Kaminsky Method, that's for sure. And you know, when I was doing my research to prepare for your interview, I started thinking there must be something about being redheaded and doing comedy. There's Red Skelton, Red Buttons, Danny mm -hmm. Kaye, Carrot Top, Lucy was a redhead, and of right. course there's you. What's the magic about being redheaded? Hmm, that's a good, interesting, no one's ever asked me that in, in that context. Maybe for a guy, it was tough in some ways being a redhead because I, sometimes you get made, picked on or made fun of and called Carrot Top and and maybe the girls, you know, you'd think would prefer the guy with the dark hair or the blonde. And, and, and you know, for, for a, a female redhead was fine. But for a guy, you know, maybe you weren't thought of as, as the real as sexy, attractive one, maybe. So maybe they felt like they had to find something else that, that could elevate them. And, you know, maybe it was humor. That's as good an answer as any, I think. Yeah. You sure. know, Donnie, a lot of people don't know that you and Ron Howard starred in the TV movie Huckleberry Finn. Ron right. was Huckleberry Finn and you were Tom Sawyer. I know yeah. you probably think you were both too old for those roles, but you looked so young that you both carried it off beautifully. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I, th I, I felt that we were a little old, but, you know, back then, well, even now, um, you know, the, the SAG rules are such that if you're under 18, the hours that you work are much more uh, limited and restricted. So um, it's tough unless you, you know, it expands your budget, makes your budget higher. We were both about 20, 
but we looked young. And they said, if you, if you could look young, they could work longer hours. And that, and that was the motivation behind it. So it was fun. I mean, it was such a blast to do that with Ron. And here we were working together and happy is, and now we're doing, you know, this classic Mark Twain classic and I'm playing Tom Sawyer. It was a great honor and, and a treat. And um, I, had a, I had a great time. Well, you know, in preparation for this interview, and you know I do my homework, Donnie, I watched it and oh. I just loved it and I recommend it to everybody. It is available okay. on DVD and you see this wonderful portrayal by these two young actors who've gone on to do such great things. So uh, I just want you to know I loved it. Oh, that's great to hear. Thank, I, I, I do appreciate that very much, Harvey. Thank you. So you've talked, Donnie, about what happened after you left Happy Days. You did leave four years before the show ended, and you've talked about going from this kind of class clown type character that you were playing as Ralph Mouth. And you know how brutal Hollywood casting directors can be when it comes to typecasting. Nobody wants to take risks. I'm just going to ask you, what advice would you give young actors out there who get typecast early in their careers like you did? You know, if you if you're having trouble getting the kinds of roles that you want, do theater where you can because then, you know, you're you're, you're working the the craft and and the muscle and you're and and you keep growing and you want to just keep growing and so that you're ready, you're ready to take on those kinds of roles and um, and theater might be an easier way to play different kinds of roles than in TV and film when you're fighting that, and then just keep your eyes and ears open and 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 network as much as you can and because you never know where that opportunity might come from perseverance is one of the most important things you can have and belief when you look back at having left happy days four years before the show ended would you have done that again if you could go back wow oh that's a that's a great question um because it was a financial decision as well as a yeah. career decision. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, probably the probably the financial one is the one that I re, I would regret most most of all. I, I on a creative sort of level, I don't regret it. You know, and and I think it was in many ways I think it was the right move. But you know, then I now I look back and go, well, all the money I could have I could have made that might have helped in some of those some situations when things were a little more lean you know and and because it 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 became more of a challenge when i wasn't working as much you know it was tough it became, but you know I, donnie yeah. it says something about your character that you were interested in professional growth and in career development and in artistic integrity than you were in money and i actually see a role model in you for doing that because you, you, you ended up being okay. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. I'm very thankful, right. To, that I'm seeing things really starting to sort of line up the way I had hoped they would, you know, because um, there were some tough, tough times where um, I wasn't working and I didn't know if I was ever, when I was going to work again and, you know, and then you have a family and, and all that. And it, it was some tricky times. I'm just so happy that I'm getting different kinds of roles now and people are recognizing it and that it will continue. I feel like I've, I've only touched the surface of what I can and want to do. Oh, I absolutely think the best is yet to come. And before we talk about your exciting singing career, I do want to ask you about your directing. Your first film in 1999 was The Last Best Sunday, which I think I saw on the Lifetime channel. It was a powerful, dramatic film, and it got great reviews, and the racism issue makes the movie still so relevant today. Yeah, it was a powerful film. Um, beautiful script written by a woman named Karen Kelly. It was my first one, as you mentioned. I, I was lucky that somehow our paths crossed, and I... I I optioned her script and I met a, and I was introduced to a producer named Michael Murphy and he liked working with first time directors. And it was a, you know, it was a great thing for me for my first film because it was mainly, it was a real actor's piece. And the two leads were fabulous, Angela Bettis and Douglas Spain. And you're right, I, the racism 
the racist issue and it is is, is still relevant. Uh, people can watch it. It's on Tubi. T U B I is one of the platforms that has, has free movies. Uh, oh, I recommend it to everybody. And then your second film, Mula, from 2007, was a comedy based on a true story. You won the Best Director Award at the Newport Beach Film Festival for that movie. And I believe you gave Shailene Woodley her start in the movie. She was only 13 at the time. You must have seen something special in her. Oh, I, I definitely did. Yeah, I remember when we were casting the, that role, she played the daughter of the lead character, played by William May Poplar. We were down to like two actresses for the, for the role. And the, the producers on the film were favoring this other gal who had real comedy chops. And she was on a TV series at the time and it was a comedy. But Shailene had such a quality about her and such a uh, truthfulness and honesty and, and uh, intelligence that I saw. And I felt that that was more important than the comedy. So I said, no, I, I, I really want to go with Shailene. And I was so glad I did. She was fabulous in the movie. I mean, she was so good, so beyond her year. I mean, she was 13 and I couldn't get over how good she was in it. Well, you know what I thought when I watched it, Donnie, I was so impressed with your skill as a director. And I wondered whether the fact that you were a child actor, you knew how to direct her. Maybe you might be right, but you know, I, I don't know if it was so much being a child actor or just being a fellow actor, you know, but, but maybe you're right. I didn't even think about it in that terms that I started pursuing it when I was still, I guess, a child. So maybe I did have some insight. In, in 2011, you directed Harley's Hill, a really touching family film that's very reminiscent of movies like National Velvet, Black Beauty, The Black Stallion. I just loved it because oh. you directed it with such heart. But I got to ask you, is it true that animal pictures are a nightmare to make? Well, when you're doing them on a very low budget, yes. <laughs> and, you know, animals and, and children, because as I mentioned with children, you don't have them for, you know, the hours that you are allowed to work with them is very limited. So if you're working on a low budget and you're going to lose the, the actor right when you're in the middle of a scene because, oh, you know, they, you, time's up. You can't, you know, they, they have to have a break now or they're done for the day. And you're like, wait a minute. You know, th it's very difficult to work with animals, obviously, and children on a low budget. And this was a low budget. It was very low. So um, it was the toughest. It was one of the toughest things I ever did. I, I, I lost like 20 pounds during the shooting of that movie. <laughs> Because it, it was just insane. I don't know how we did it, but we somehow got through it. And the movie came out. It's really, you know, it's a sweet film. It's it really was. So, Donnie, let's talk about your real passion, music. You're a crooner in the style of Sinatra, Dean Martin, Tony Bennett. You're bringing back the Great American Songbook in your albums and concerts. What I love is that you finally returned to doing what you've wanted to do all your life. Because if I'm correct, you used to perform with a big band in a jazz club about 35 years ago, didn't you? Wow. Yeah, I did for a very short time. I, I wanted to do that music. And it was tough back in the late 70s and early 80s because that style of music was sort of looked upon as passe back then. I did a jazz club in L.A., a couple of Sundays, I think two or three Sundays, we did it with a big band and um, people loved it. But, you know, we didn't get it was hard to get a big crowd and it was just not commercial kind of music at the time. And then I started getting busy with other projects. So I just, you know, kind of put it aside. Many people may not remember, but you did release an album way back in 1976. Yeah, you know, I did get to do that album. It was United Artists was the label. And um, because I was in Happy Days, these producers were able to get a deal from me. But they said, you can't do the music. You know, I, when I brought up the music that I really love, they were, it was like I was alluding to earlier. They were like, no, no, they're not going to, you know, that's not considered commercial. And they, you're going to have to do more pop, rock kind of stuff, not jazz standards, <laughs> you know, in 1976 for a guy in his 20s to be doing that. It, it didn't seem to make sense to them. 
Your album entitled D Most Mostly Swinging came out in 2017. How did you go about selecting the songs for that album? That's a good question. It was tough because I remember I, I went through all my like my iTunes playlist and you know when I sat down with Willie Murillo, the producer, he started with a list of probably about 80 songs, you know, <laughs> and maybe even more. And then we kind of whittle it down based on you know, just the first pass, we might've gotten it down to like 40. And then what I did was I, I, I recorded, uh, some of them I recorded at home. So then this way the, the producer could hear me, you know, like Sinatra's version of a song or Bobby Darren's version of a song and, and hear me doing it. Then he, he would say, you know, I really like you on that one. I really like you on this one. And we started, you know, whittling it down even further. So it, it was a real collaborative, kind of um, process and we finally got it down to the 12 songs I guess it was 12 or 13. Yeah it's a really great album I do want to remind everyone that Donnie's latest single Smoke from a Distant Fire will be released June the 25th and there is the new album coming out that you know prior to the pandemic you were performing your big band show Donnie Most Sings and Swings in some of the most prestigious nightclubs in the country are you planning more shows when the pandemic is over? I hope so, yeah. I'm in about a week and a half, I'm doing a, a jazz festival here in Southern California. It'll be my first time back in over a year doing anything. So I'm excited about that. I hope to be doing clubs again and, and also theaters and performing arts centers. That's what I really would like to be doing. And I'm hoping to do, uh, love to do it with like a pop symphony. That's something I'm really, have my my aspiration set on. Oh, I hope so too. I would love to see you do that. So at this stage of your life, you're singing again. I know you'll be performing again. Could you ever be persuaded to do another TV series? If something yeah. like the Kaminsky method came along, would you take it? Oh yes, definitely. I would, yeah, I mean, a really good, a really good show like that, you know, um, really i love the writing and and uh that kind of quality in terms of the way they the way it's directed and, and the, the ensemble uh kind of setting i think uh i would love to you know donnie i've really enjoyed this chance to catch up with you and celebrate your wonderful career and your many talents thank you so so much for coming on our show i wish you the best of luck with the album with the movie you're about to do please come back anytime you're always welcome Oh, that's very kind, Harvey. Thank you. I really enjoyed our chat, and um, you asked some some really good questions, some ones that uh, were were new to me and made me uh, think a little bit. So, um, thank you for uh, stimulating me in that regard, and um, th thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Donnie. Our guest has been actor, director, and singer Donnie Most. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Remember to subscribe to the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel and be sure to check out more great interviews with Harvey Brownstone on HarveyBrownstoneInterviews.com.